Okay, I'm here at the end of the session. Normally I would have a dog here, but again, Carl is uh, an anxious dog and uh, a little bit reactive around humans. So we put him upstairs so he can kind of chill out. Um, this is his roadmap to success. Now, basically we spent most of the session, Carl was here for the most of the session, uh, but at one point I did drop something and he lost it and kind of got a, what we call a buff threshold. And when you have a dog that's reactive and they get reactive, they are essentially hysterical. They are not gonna listen to anything. Now, the guardians did a great job, and if you have those sort of things, I want you to repeat what you did. So what we did was they crinkled the, the, uh, the bag of treats and make a, a kissing sound is very attractive to dogs. Usually they look at you. And then what I did is I had the guardian hold, and I didn't explain this ahead of time. It's a little science of the hand. If I hold my hand like this with my fingers slightly curled, I can have a treat and the dogs can't see it from its perspective. So what I do is I make a kissing sound, the dog looks at me and then I start lowering my hand to the treat and I curl my fingers up higher as I go low so the dog can't see that. I, and pantomime, I've seen people go like this. Well, the dog knows you don't have anything. The lower you go, the more it's for the dog. And the dogs, and then Carl came over here and then we put him into a sit, gave him a treat and said sit. Put him in a da lay down position, gave him a treat and said crash. So you wanna kind of redirect them for whatever it is, get them to come away on their own, preferably without pulling them. What I wanna do is keep the leash a certain distance so he can't get that far, but then we don't wanna pull the dog because that can sometimes intensify the reaction. We call him away, he comes on his own volition, we make him do two or three different things, we give him a couple of treats, he's appointed away from the person, the person should be quiet and not move at that point. And then we give him some rewards for doing some positive things. And you remember, you are gonna have ebbs and flows. If you do have a friend come over, somebody that you're trying to, try to avoid new people, and, and really wanna focus on the stuff we talk, we're gonna talk about here, um, uh, to get the dog in a position to succeed. Uh, but if you do, always try to redirect the dog, and if you can't, sometimes you might have to take him in the next room and help him, and it'd be better to take him in the next room than having your guest get up and move, because really what Carl's saying is, I didn't give that person permission to come in here in the first place, I certainly didn't authorize sneezing. I don't know what these people are thinking. And that's really, he thinks he's in charge of the world because he didn't really have any rules or structure and his guardians were, like many of my clients do, rewarding a lot of in, uh, behaviors that they don't want inadvertently. Um, and that's why we went over petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is essentially if the dog comes up and nudges me, he likes to paw at people or kind of lean into them or whatever it is, when he does that, he's telling us what to do. If we follow his lead, then we're telling him, yes, you are the boss of us. And that reinforces him thinking that he needs to protect us and be possessive of us. So from now on, when he comes up and nudges you or, or demands attention, we're gonna give him a counter order. Tell him to sit. If he's already sitting, ask him to lay down. Don't, no shakes. Uh, that's confusing for dogs. And then once he sits, then we can pet him uh, under, uh, preferably under the chin. We're gonna say just the command word, just sit or just crash or whatever the word is. Um, and then I can pet him as much as I want after that. But remember, anytime you're petting him, he puts his paw on your arm, immediately stop petting him. That's dominance. Um, and so petting with a purpose is making him earn that affection, which will boost his self-esteem. It'll help him practice the desired action behavior, makes it easier to do in other situations. It'll help increase his respect for the humans as authority figures because they're listening, uh, he's listening to them. And also helps to flip the leader follower dynamic so he understands when I tell the humans what to do, nothing happens. But if they tell me what to do and I do it, I get paid. So I'm more inclined to do that. Now remember, after a while, he'll start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for that attention. When he does, pet him a little bit under his chin and say whatever the command word is. And if he shrugs you off, you say, shut up and you take that positive reinforcement. It's about the only force that I ever do. Uh, now that also, uh, remember to recognize when he does prepay, we do pet him and say that whatever those things are. Even if you're watching TV and you're distracted, after a while you just do a little bit of a pet. Now he might, I, I think I already saw him, he'll like come and sit and sit again and sit again. Why aren't you petting? Well, make sure you're rewarding that. Now, um, if he does that a lot, then that could be an indication that he needs more exercise. And that's one of the other things we talked about. Before I get to the exercise though, does Carl ever come in here and like drag his shoulder along the side of the couch? Yeah. That can be scent marking. My couch, I put Carl scent on it so anybody comes in knows it's mine. We wanna disagree with that. Um, all right, so for the, we talked about creative ways of exercising and starting an exercise journal. Keep the exercise journal for about two to four weeks. Write down the, the, the date at the top, a fresh piece of paper, write down the time on the left, and write down how long the walk was, how many up-downs on the stairs. Remember, come up with fun commands, and come up with fun commands with all the new commands you're teaching him. Um, so we throw the treat down the stairs, call it Australia, and then he comes back up and say penthouse, and the first time do it with an empty stomach until he says, you're crazy, I'm not going to get that anymore. And now we know his maximum number of up-downs is, and we want to exercise him about 30 to 50% of that maximum number. If we have guests coming over, um, anything's gonna be going on, exercise him before, and if he gets rambunctious or 
growl grumbly for treats or for attention or whatever it is. And don't interpret that as him being naughty. Interpret that as his way of saying, I need some attention. And then immediately take him to the stairs and do the up downs. Also check out the laser. If he chases it and he's not super stressed out about it, you can have him chase the laser. Some dogs do get stressed out. And if that's the case, we don't want to contribute. Um, also get an eye fetch. Teach him how to play fetch with that eye fetch. That would be a great way for him to put, burn some extra, and excess energy on his own. Um, let me see. And then scent games. Google scent games. Look for YouTube. There's a whole bunch of books and DVDs, but just do a couple free ones first and see if he's into it. It's very physically draining to uh, make them use their, um, their nose. Now, remember, if he, anytime he's reacting, the best thing you do is increase distance. If you're out in a walk or something and he's walk around a car, walk around a shrubbery or whatever it is, and then try to get his attention, have this bag of treats. Even when this is empty, keep this bag. That becomes a very strong attractant to a dog. So if he starts uh, staring at another dog, and that's usually when you're out on a walk, what's going to happen is the first thing he's going to do is he's going to see the other, be like, hey, I'm Carl, and start lowering his head. That instant is when you want to redirect his attention. Most people wait and then they, they don't, not even aware of what's going on. Now I'm staring, my tail goes up, my ears go, well, his ears are always up. Uh, the hackles go up, he's licking his lips, he's snarling a little bit, and then the, the dog's getting closer and closer and finally, Rawr! and so we didn't read the signs. Now they can happen within like a second or two, but if we can learn to read his signals, and as soon as he says, I'm uncomfortable with that other dog, and we turn and we walk down somebody's driveway, and give enough distance for that dog to walk, then he doesn't feel like he needs to be reactive. Now, right now, I think I'm pretty sure he has cortisol in his blood because he's just stressed out because he thinks he's in charge of his humans and his humans don't listen to him. And the humans, like I said, have done some things inadvertently that have confused him. Petting with a purpose is one of the easiest things you can do and I have people that disregard it. It is so powerful if you get in the habit of it doing it because of the repetition. So make sure you do that, that's a huge one. Passive training is also huge. So every time that he puts his chin down, chill him. Every time he brings you a toy, name each individual toy. Every time he lays down, put him say crash. Remember, when you're, if he knows the command, we give him the command word first, sit. And then we sit and we pet him and say the word sit during the reward stage. If he doesn't know the command, we just wait for him to organically do it through passive training. And as soon as he does it, chill him. And after a while, you'll be, he'll be able to, and then we'd like to transition the chilling from the table to here. But once he has the auditory, then he can kind of hold the treat and he kind of lead him over with his nose and put it down and then pop the treat in his mouth and say, chillin'. After a while, he'll make the connection between the two. Um, let me see, uh, going back to uh, rules, not being allowed on the furniture, buy the X-Mats. It'll cost you like about 70 bucks, but it just will keep him off the furniture. Uh, and you don't have to police it yourself. And you don't want to, remember, we don't want to force him off. If he does get on the furniture, take a treat out, touch his nose with it and drop it on the floor. Get a treat pouch like that. I really, I have a lot of people like, ah, I have a purse or this, that, and the other thing. It clips under your belt. You can spring it open and it stays open. And you close it whenever you want. It just, and now you're pay, you have the potential to pay him off and you have those treats handy. Remember you have three seconds. So he does something the right thing and you're like, you missed your three second window. It's just a lot faster. And remember, just because you have treats doesn't mean you can give them. Affection is a wonderful reward just uh, as well. Remember, pat him under the chin whenever possible. You can scratch him up here and caress him. Just don't ever pat up here. But you can scratch his butt in other places as well. Uh, let me see. What else? Um, not being allowed to be here on the, uh, on the carpet. Now, I usually like to give dogs directional commands. So what I would do is I would take one of these treats when we're going to eat. Now, I can do the same thing with bacon here as where I talked about the kitchen. So maybe roast, uh, microwave some roast beef. Stop giving him people food, first of all, off our plate. But when we come over here and you have a Chipotle burrito, put the burrito there with your coasters, microwave some roast beef, don't leave it here because he'll eat it, and then, when, and then pretend like you're eating your roast beef, um, but before you do this, you can set him up for success by teaching him leaving the carpeted area. So I'd say he's not allowed in this L when we're eating food here. Now when he's hanging out and there is no food, we're gonna take a treat, throw it over there. When he goes over there and licks it up, say the word out. What I would do is I would do this with every room in your house. I actually take these treats and tear them in half, throw out here, out, well, this is confined area, but throw out there. So we're teaching him to go out there is rewardable. And we're putting it in context and we're rewarding him for doing it. So after doing it with no reason to want to be here, later on when we do have food and we say out, he knows what we mean. Because usually we say out, we're kind of pissed he's underfoot. And it's like, well, now you don't, you know, you're upset with me. So what I do is I usually do for every doorway in the house. I go in there, touch his nose, throw the treat three feet in the hallway. When he gets it, said out. And I do that, and he comes back and do a second treat. I do it with every doorway in the house. I would also do it around the, ta the uh, 
the area rug right under your table. So he gets practice moving out and he understands what you mean. Then I do the whole circuit again, but this time I stand outside the kitchen and I throw the treat in the kitchen and we lick goes in the kitchen to get it. I say kitchen. When he comes here, maybe say living or you know media. Come up with a word for each room. So now you have directional commands to teach him to go the, to the uh, kitchen or out of the kitchen. Um, one thing for the stairs, he likes to race up and down the stairs. And that's one of the rules is he can't be in front. Well, we don't want to be using any force. So as you start, it's easier to do this if you're actually walking down the stairs and up because you have to repeat. Uh, actually, I guess it would be better to go up for the way that we're doing this. Um, so start walking up the stairs. And as soon as he recognizes he runs in front of you, turn around and come and sit back down. And don't say a word to him. And he'll come back down and be like, I thought we were going upstairs, man. What's up? And he said, calm. Start it again. You'll probably have several times of going back and forth, but eventually he'll figure out as soon as I walk in front of them, they lose interest in going upstairs. So he will teach him to start walking behind us, and that's a follower's mindset. Um, you could also teach him to stay and have him stay there, but I think this would be a bit more effective, more helpful in, in other ways uh, by just doing it with the little opera conditioning. Um, same thing with the leash. Don't say we're going for a walk or walkies or any of the rest of that stuff. Remember, excited is not necessarily happy. So walk towards where the leash is. And if Susie walks in front, turn around, sit back down. When you get to the leashes, tell him to sit and start reaching for it. As soon as he gets up, pull your hand back, tell him to sit. If he sits within three seconds, I continue. If he doesn't, I walk away. This is why you wanna practice these activities when you're not actually planning on going for a walk. And really, if you get super excited for the walk, I usually tell people you should try to leash him up three to five times for every one time we go for a walk and desensitize him for those. Uh, now, the guardians were asking me a little bit about they, if, if they're going for a while, if they should leave him out. If he doesn't destroy things, I only kettle or restrict, restrict dogs access if they're going to get in trouble. This I might worry about a little bit if he's pulling these down, if he hears a sound, I could see him tearing these down. And I had one, dog, one client with a St. Bernard that did it on the second floor and ended up on the roof somehow. They had to get the fire department to come. So remember, on the, outs, on the other side of these windows, put white paper so you can have your windows open. You can still see out because you're taller than Carl. And the white paper really just acts as a filter. That way you can enjoy a little sunlight because I'm guessing you probably don't like having these shutters shutter all the time. Enjoy your house a little bit. And that's called maintenance. So he can't go and look out. Do the same thing for your door and do it as high up enough so he can't see out the door. And make sure you put it on the outside so he can't just scratch them off. Um, and you can do the same thing with those if he does those windows as well. Um, let me see, what else do we go over? Uh, or other rules. Um, uh, not being in the kitchen when we're allowed to be there. So again, teaching him to go out of the kitchen. Um, I'm gonna go over how to do that, which I forgot to do earlier. We'll do that here in a sec. Um, let me see. Uh, and for the kitchen, remember, microwave and pretend like you're cooking. And then you can make him go out. Um, so, um, well, I guess I'll tell you now. So I uh, have a couple ways I disagree with dogs. The first thing I do is I make a hissing sound like a cat. I have 10 of them. I have a level one, I have a level 10 where it's like, and the dog, like, well, you'll see them snap. It's autonomic or autonomic, I'm not saying either one was right, but basically it's an instinct because so many animals make a hissing sound as a warning. I hiss before the dog does the wrong thing. When I want to say, no, don't do that, or most effectively, don't even think about doing that. Once you cross the threshold, you stand up abruptly. To a dog standing up at your I mean business because you're burning the energy and your authority goes whatever direction your hips and shoulders are pointing. So point it directly at the dog. And when you do that, you stand up suddenly, the dog will usually take a step back, ooh, it just got real in here. Well, he was in a relaxed position, now you took a commanding position, he takes a step back to counter your move. Then what he's gonna do is gonna walk around to see, are you talking to me? So wherever he goes, you pivot and keep your hips and shoulders at, pointed at him without moving your feet. And you do that until he tells you I'm done challenging you, and he will tell you he's done challenging you by stop moving. He'll stand, sit, or lie down. When he stands, sits, or lies down, take two steps backwards, and only two steps, don't shuffle your feet. By two steps, I mean le left or right left, and then that, and stop. When dogs communicate with each other, they do it through movement, and they stop between movements as a way of saying that's a, that's a communication. Otherwise, you take three steps, oh, she's just meandering around. So you take those, as soon as he stops moving, you take two steps backwards, pause for one second, then you can go back to doing what we're doing. However, if what you were doing is doing what I'm doing now, sitting down, probably showing that I have a little bit more belly than I like, um, then I lose some authority when I sit down. So don't sit deeply in the couch, sit on the edge so you can bounce up right away. And you should expect he's probably gonna challenge you again. Remember, his job is to push your boundaries. Our job is to say this is where the boundary is and enforcing it consistently. One of the dirty secrets of dog behavior is uh, outlasting the dog. Every time you let the dog have the shoe and you're like, oh, I'm late for work and you ruin the shoe and I just have it, 
You just made him more defiant the next time he does it. So you'll have to pay a bit of a penance and pay uh, and let him know, look, I'm willing to let the dinner burn and the people at the door can go to hell because I'm going to follow through and get my way. And once you reach that tipping point, he'll start giving in faster and faster and faster. But it's not forcing him, it's just outlasting him. Okay, so the second consequence, stand up abruptly, turn to face the dog, keep it pointed, your hips pointed out until he's stationary, take two steps backwards and pause, then go back to doing what you're doing. The third consequence I have is marching deliberately at the dog. Before we get into this one, I'd like you guys to also to get in the habit of not walking around Carl if he's standing. That's a, a, a follower would move more steps around so the leader doesn't have to do that. Instead, I want you to walk through him as if he's not there and don't shove him with your legs. Walk as if he's invisible and if you bump into him, you bump into him, he's a big dog, we're not gonna hurt him. And, uh, and then what it teaches him is when the human's coming, my job is to get out of their way. That's a follower's mindset as well. So the third consequence is uh, to uh, march deliberately at the dog. Now, if I'm the dog and you, and you march at me and I back up a mile when I'm still facing you, still challenging. So I'm gonna uh, march directly at the dog until the dog does this, turns sideways to you or greater. Once he does it, you stop in place. Because that's the timing of your stop is everything. And then you go to the second consequence, you're pivoting as he moves around the room when he's stationary, step, step, pause, go back to doing what I'm doing. The only time this doesn't apply is if he's breaking another rule. Let's say he's not allowed to be in the kitchen because we're cooking. We hiss at him before he comes in, when he, but he breaks the threshold anyways. We march deliberately, at, and when you march at him, have some steam in your step. If you are so, soft, he was like, ah, oh, she doesn't really mean it. She, he doesn't think, you have a flinching experience. So have some sudden movement. And as soon as he crosses outside the kitchen, stop. So that's your way of saying, this is the invisible boundary I want you to enforce. Now, once he stops, then he's gonna kind of pace around, wait for him to stop moving, then take two steps backwards, facing him, walking backwards into the kitchen, left, right, and stop, or right, left, whatever you wanna do, and pause. He will probably come forward. When he does, you hiss and rush forward as your way of saying, no, stop the line. And then when he stops moving, take two steps backwards again. Eventually, he will stay stationary. When he does, then take two more steps backwards and probably come forward. And you're gonna keep repeating that process until he understands every time I try to come in the kitchen, she disagrees. And then when he sits or lies down, that's when you can go back to doing what you wanna do. And that's when you would be uh, starting uh, cooking your bacon and all the rest of that stuff. And again, keeping him, but helping him practice stay out of the kitchen is good practice for when eventually he'll have to stay out of the baby's room. Um, and it helps him develop self-control. It's not the baby gate is there. I'm stopping because my guardians have told me to and communicated what they want. Um, another rule, the guardians need to eat something before they feed him and stop leaving food in his bowl. Right now he doesn't eat it. And this is a common mistake people make is they'll leave the dog, the food in the bowl all the time. Well, then the dog, it's not precious. It's, I can eat whatever I want. In the wild, they eat in the order of the rank and they only eat if they have a successful hunt. So if you leave food in the bowl all the time, then he's like, whatever. So I put food in the bowl the first couple of times and he's not, he's gonna not gonna wanna, doesn't care because he's used to not doing it. Take one of these treats and have one of these treats and then grab a chip or whatever it is, something that you can eat in five more bites. When you get done, drop the treat into his bowl. And, it's, and he'll probably come over and lick just that one treat up. And as soon as he walks away, pick up the bowl, dump it empty, put the empty bowl back down. I would recommend you get a elevated feeder um, cause, and, and try a different bowls, try a plastic bowl and some other stuff. But I, you know, he doesn't drink down here very much. I started talking about this, I, I realized I didn't finish. Um, I float my dog's food. So I put hot water in with his food. Make sure you're, he's eating first. Remember, it's gonna probably be a day or two before he actually eats when you switch to the structured feeding. Once he's eating consistently when you put the food down, then you can actually put a pint of warm water in with his food, swirl it around. He has to drink that water before he gets to his food. First time do it, don't do it, put a pint, put just enough where it's floating. But eventually you're getting, helping him get more water intake. Uh, and so that can be a nice thing uh, to keep him hydrated. Uh, but try out different bowls, uh, different types of uh, material for the bowls. Maybe there's, or take his collar off, see if maybe it's a ding, it's hitting the bowl. I mean, I've seen people where like, you know, the dog, you know, eats out of the wrong bowls, they put the bowl down and as soon as the dog touches it, they hit the dog. We don't know if any of those things happen, but there could be a whole lot of reasons why he doesn't want to do these things. But I think if you're eating in front of him first, five more bites, then give him permission, or real meal if you can, uh, and then give him permission to eat. And if he walks away, if you pick it up and dump it, and eventually you'll put the food down and he'll want to eat it right away. Um, all right. Um, I'll try to think um, other, is there anything else we went over that we want to go over? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I covered a lot in three hours. We really spent a long time really just going over all the little things. Remember, play hard to get. Um, and again, stopping interacting with him is a powerful way of communicating that you don't like that behavior. Oh, when you come home. 
So when you come home, if he jumps up on you, just cross your arms and freeze and look up and don't give him any command, just wait. As soon as he gets down, pet him and say off. And if he, can, if he gets really rough on you, step outside the door and stand right there and wait. And if it's, if it's a habit, maybe go around to the front door so you can actually have the little, you're safe, you know, safe from the elements out here. But basically, if you pet him when he jumps up on you, you're gonna be rewarding him. So come up with some watch words. So, you know, uh, you know, something that just means to stop or you're petting without a purpose. I usually use paycheck when I think you're petting without a purpose. I say testify when I think that you're uh, doing, you're missing an opportunity to reward desired behaviors. And, and come up with a list of the official command words and say vocabulary. If somebody's using a different version of the word, if the word is come, somebody says, come here, uh, vocabulary, come. Um, and try to come up with funny command words. You don't have to change the words you already have, except for down, I would probably change that one. But all the new things that you come up with are uh, come up with a new command word. Now the guardian mentions that, that, that he knows a lot of tricks. Um, trick, behavior and training are separate, but there's a little bit of overlap in terms of uh, self-control and discipline. So teaching him how to treat, uh, balance a treat on his nose or on his paw. Uh, teaching him to stay is a wonderful one. That's great self-control. If you want to teach him to stay, you need to teach for duration first, up to five minutes, and then for distance. Don't mix those together, you're making them too difficult. Then for distraction, and if you want videos for any of these things, I have them on my website. If you can't find them, text me. I'm happy to send them your way. Uh, but make sure you disagree again if he's scent marking, uh, rubbing his shoulder on that, that's definitely uh, not ideal. Um, Try to think. Um, oh, for grandma, we could do this, the CER. So have her get a washcloth without a lot of perfume uh, just have her wipe herself down. It doesn't have to be too invasive. And just put it in a Ziploc bag, and then all you do is just have it behind your back, a handful of treats here, and have him sit, flash the washcloth, he sifts it, pull it away, pop a treat in his mouth, or drop it on the floor. And I would say grandma's name when he licks it up, so we create a positive association with that as well. And so what we're doing is we're just introducing his scent uh, without the presence of grandma, or the sight of grandma, or the movement of grandma, just one thing. Now he is, I don't want to say a bully, but I think he gets, he has some fun teasing and playing with some people. Remember, if he growls at you for any, you know, like, you know, give me more treats, definitely don't reward that. And there you can also use the fourth quadrant of operant conditioning, which is a negative punishment. That means to lead, deduct something in the equation, in this case, you. So when you're coming home, if he's all excited, he's jumping up on you and you freeze and he keeps on jumping up, step outside. Or if he comes up and nudges you and he's not listening to you, go away and close the door behind him. So now he's like, wow, I, I was nudging her, I wanted her to play with me, and instead of playing with me, she left. That's definitely the opposite of what I'm looking for. And so the playing a little that hard to get will really help. Um, now, make sure you text me if you have any questions. What I'd like you guys to do is focus on all this stuff for about, th uh, about well, really for a month, but I'd like you to call me in about two weeks with a progress report. Text me before if you have any questions, especially if you need those videos. But uh, I'm starting to get booked up pretty far in advance, and so we'll set up a one-hour follow-up session. We'll probably just do that on a weekend. And uh, as the weather gets nicer, we might do some bat training outside where we can help him practice being around someone at a great enough distance where he's not reactive when you do the cheese and all the rest of that stuff. But text me in about, uh, or call in about two weeks uh, and we'll get something on the books uh, for like mid-March. Hopefully then the weather is a little bit nicer. Um, okay, well normally I would say uh, this is Carl uh, and this is Carl's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you meet it.